To Madam Filth, Nosferatu liar and faithless provocateur. I am struggling through a haze of disgust as I sit down to write to you. I have borne witness to your sleazy, dishonorable dealings in the court of Prince Valon over many nights, and I have been silent. I will congratulate you on that. Whatever manipulation you held over Amelia to force my hand was well played. As I survey the wreckage you leave behind you, I tip my hat, Madam Filth. Though I take no comfort in the fact that I'm not the only person you've royally fucked over. Your return to London couldn't come soon enough, and let me assure you that Amelia's boons will be of no help to you should you make the mistake of returning to Paris while I hold the position of sheriff. With the information that you have requested from Prince Valon's private archives, I consider my debt to Amelia paid. And your welcome here now ended. You are a selfish, wicked thing, and a blight on any domain which will have you. After my retainer delivers this message to you, I want you out of Paris within 48 hours. As a purveyor of information, you should know something of my reputation, and ask yourself if I am bluffing. My history of dealing with undesirables is well known. Before you go, though, let me tell you that you have been seen. The deplorable acts you have done in order to gain support for Queen Anne's succession to Mithras, Lord of Avalon, have been observed. I know who you are. I've seen through the mask you've presented to others. You may have gotten away with achieving your preferred outcomes in the Camarilla politics of London, but I am sure that in the end, fate will deal with you most harshly. We need not defer to some mystic notions of karma. Your rotten character will fall afoul of someone as cruel and vindictive as yourself one day, and they will deal with the creature known as Madame Filth with finality. Of this I am sure. Regarding the information you demanded, I will enclose it in this letter. I can see why one of these bloodlines is of interest to you, but I have a hard time seeing the relevance of the others. There are many stories surrounding vampiric bloodlines, some of which are supported by a great deal of testimony and evidence. Some of these stories are just wisps of myth, parables told in whispers from sire to child as a warning of what may lurk in the darkness away from the light of an ordered society like the Camarilla. What information I may provide to you from Prince Valon's archive may vary in its specific utility to you for this reason, but in any case, our arrangement is over. These bloodlines create as many questions as they provide answers, and many of those questions ask a kindred to stray into dangerous, perhaps heretical, areas. These bloodlines are often connected to myths about the supposed antediluvians, the superstitious stories about the origin of kindred. Your mileage may vary depending on the stock you put in such tales. With that said, let us begin. You expressed an interest in the deviations of the Lazombra, and there is a notable example of one such strange bloodline. Known as the Chiosid, this branch of the Lazombra clan is one of the most well-known and confirmed bloodlines among the mysterious varieties you asked about. The origins of the Chiosid are found in the 4th century AD, in the Roman Empire, where a Lazombra elder, known as Macronius took part in a strange experiment. The details are murky, but it is said that the Lazombra sampled a concoction of blood belonging to a god of the underworld, leavened with some mixture of vitae from the mysterious creatures known as the Fae. Macronius was forever altered. He grew to over seven feet in height. His skin grew white like chalk and his eyes became thick black orbs in their sockets. 
This transformation is uniform among the Kyocid. Without many precautions, this strange appearance represents a risk to the masquerade. Beyond the physical alterations, the Kyocid descendants of Macronius have also gained control of a discipline known as Mythersaria. This discipline grants the vampire mystical senses, the ability to steal knowledge, and other powers attributed to the Fae. Luckily, they are not great in number and prefer a solitary experience, though some do associate with the Sabbat. These Canites are a hybrid of supernatural beings in a sense, and in my opinion, should be annihilated on sight. Another lineage you requested information on was the Malkavian bloodline known as the Anunnaki. These Canates often served as oracles and seers in the past. The Anunnaki believe that the secrets of the universe can be witnessed in a microcosm by scrutinizing the bodies of the recently dead. Wisdom can only be gained by savagely tearing into the corporeal physically delving through the inner workings of each creature in creation. As the faith of the kind changed, and history ebbed and flowed, the Anunnaki became more rare. Their fascination with reading entrails of animals and people is harrowing for any holding on to their humanity, and it isn't uncommon for these Malkavian oracles to fall to their beast. The Anunnaki suffer from a psychosis beyond the normal madness of the Malkavian clan, which makes their degeneration worse. They are compelled to collect trophies from their dead human victims, and are greatly obsessed with these grisly collections. Despite the risk of rapidly falling to the beast, this bloodline has seen something of a resurgence in the 20th century. Perhaps such dark kindred flourish in times as dark as these. I can assume why this third bloodline holds an interest for you. The Nosferatu have few stories of bloodline divergence, strangely enough, but there is one myth I found in the archive. I find the stories hard to believe, but this is what you demanded be provided to you, so you're free to believe what you want. The bloodline is known as the Niktuku, whose name means they who guide death. And they are things of nightmares. For me, the giveaway to this being superstitious nonsense is the myth of its origins. The Niktuku were not an evolved race of canines. They are created by the antediluvian of the Nosferatu, designed to destroy his Nosferatu descendants. Indeed, according to this myth, the Niktuku are the true Nosferatu, and most of the Nosferatu we see every night are the descendants of a renegade child of the Nosferatu founder. The motive of the antediluvian is supposedly one of self-loathing. His contempt for his own clan drove him to create these creatures to hunt them. All of the Niktuku are believed to be of low generation, with none of the mythological creatures believed to be higher than the sixth generation. And they are said to mostly slumber in torpor, awaiting the will of their sire. But some are said to be active, and their nights are spent hunting the Nosferatu wherever they may find them. This bloodline varies from the Nosferatu in several ways, the first of which is that they are all bloodbound, supposedly, to the Nosferatu founder himself. Secondly, they prize beauty among their potential victims for embrace above all other considerations. Also, they do not immediately become monstrous, though they are disturbing to witness, but the person seeing them would be hard-pressed to explain why. They are wide-eyed, their skin may be too perfect, their teeth too white, their fingers too long and graceful. Both their hunger and their beauty are inhuman, 
and these are their defining characteristics, at least at first. The Niktiku draw little sustenance from human blood. They need vampiric blood to truly survive and thrive. Also, while their own life begins with marked beauty, every century they live, they grow more monstrous. And as some Niktuku are thousands of years old, the myths say, they have become truly disgusting creatures in form as well as in nature. All rather terrifying, if it was remotely plausible. I myself won't lose any sleep worrying about these phantoms. Your next inquiry was a bit more complex. Ostensibly, the followers of Set have a bloodline known as the Lasique, a Latin American offshoot of their quasi-religious clan. But there are some problems with this theory. First, rather than Set, these Mesoamerican vampires venerate Tezcatlipoca, a god of darkness and sorcery, translated as the Smoking Mirror. Secondly, this supposed bloodline of Setites doesn't have Serpentis as a natural power of their blood. Serpentis is the defining discipline of the Setite clan, an ability that makes the followers of Set singular. Instead, the Lasike have the power of Protean, the rare powers of the Gangrel. What is also strange is that unlike the Gangrel shapeshifters, the Lasike shift into the form of jaguars rather than wolves, making the bloodline hard to obviously fit into any one box. The Lasike are not numerous, only embracing members of Native American groups from the American Southwest to South America, but seem dedicated to their worship of their dark god in its old manifestation rather than updating their faith to set specific adulation. It is possible that the followers of Set have mistakenly adopted a gangrel bloodline as one of their own. Who knows what secrets the Lasique may have learned through this mistaken adoption, and for what purpose these canines continue to endure under the error. It's an interesting and strange development. The final group you expressed an interest in was an offshoot of my own Bruja clan, though perhaps it is more accurate to say the origin of the Bruja clan, if the stories were to be believed. As with the Nosferatu, I find the myth surrounding this shadowy bloodline to be unbelievable. In the fragments of lore I read through, they are called, quite simply, the True Bruja. This name stems from the claim that these canines are actually the true original Bruja, and my clan is the bloodline. In these stories, the Bruja Antediluvian was diabolized by one of his childer 5,000 years ago. But there remained a small group of kindred descended from that original ancient who are quite different from Bruja like myself. We in the Bruja clan have a reputation for hot tempers and a struggle with our beasts that sometimes tilts us towards violence. These supposed true Bruja are said to have a different nature. They are cold and dispassionate, more like machines than men. This condition grows worse as these beings get older, becoming more and more alien. Much more incredible is the power natural to their blood. Our Bruja's strength with celerity is a potent power that makes my clan a formidable opponent on any battlefield. But the true Bruja are said to have a very different ability. Not a supernatural speed, but a mastery over time itself. This power is called Temporis. While Bruja may be fast, true Bruja do not need to be. Instead, they claim to have some control over the speed in which time itself operates. This seems ridiculous on its face. I have never witnessed such a power, nor heard tell of it, until reading through Prince Valon's records. 
but along with many myths, I suspect this to be another superstition told in the boring nights of the old world. If these true Bruja had such gifts, who could defeat them? While there is no way for me to forgive you bending my honor to betray Prince Valon's confidence in looking at these archives, I would have thought such dishonorable acts would at least be in service of something more tangible, rather than these silly stories of monsters that go bump in the night or irrelevant mutations of ancient blood. It is an amazing ability you have, Madam Filth, to degrade and defile those who manage to get into contact with you. And despite your protestations that you will ask nothing more, know that I do not believe you. Your word has little value. And I know that when it comes to dealing with a canite of such low character, threats are the only currency that you truly accept. So know this. We are done. And if you skulk back to Paris trying to blackmail me, as you have so many others, you will meet your final death. Amelia's relationship with you is unfathomable to me, and I assume that you have some dirty leverage over her. I would recommend you leave her alone, for she has many friends. While I'm sure you won't take these warnings seriously at first, you'll soon find that your world gets very small if you decide to ignore them. While you are vile, I don't think you are stupid. So I'll expect a shrewd analysis of the risks should you contact me again or endanger my friend Amelia. Sheriff Alexander Yates, Clan Bruja, Paris, February 1944.